This podcast is part of the Big Heads Media Podcast Network. Go to BigHeadsMedia.com for more great podcasts. You are listening to In a City Like Yours, a semi-monthly podcast featuring interesting people with interesting life stories. This podcast may contain language and or subject matter not suitable for all audiences. Listener discretion is advised. I'm your host, Michael G. Moore. Please visit our website at inacitylikeyours.com. That's I-N-A-C-I-T-Y. L-I-K-E-Y-O-U-R-S dot C-O-M for links to our social media, all popular podcast platforms, and links of interest pertaining to all episodes. On this episode, Steve tells of his growing up obsessed with the golden age of Hollywood, in particular, the Marx Brothers, and even more, Groucho Marx. At the age of 19, Steve was afforded the opportunity to work for Groucho as his secretary, an offer of which he was more than willing to accept. He worked for Groucho from 1974 until Groucho's death in August of 1977. Steve is the author of the book, Raised Eyebrows, My Years Inside Groucho's House, which is soon to become a major motion picture. His current interests include voiceover work, writing, and the art of correspondence. Here is Steve's story. Hi, my name is Steve Stolier. I'm calling from Studio City, California. I am now a uh, writer and voiceover actor. My story concerns my obsession with the Marx Brothers, specifically Groucho Marx. You know, the word fan is really just an abbreviation for fanatic, and I I uh, have no shame about admitting to having been just a fanatic Marx Brothers fan, certainly since high school. But even before then, um, I had an Uncle Joe who was a balding man with glasses and a, and a uh, mustache and cigar. And he used to wiggle his eyebrows and say clever things. So once I finally discovered Groucho on TV, I thought, he seems eerily similar to Uncle Joe. And then my parents would often cite lines from Marx Brothers films, like being vaccinated with a phonograph needle and uh, that sort of thing. So when I finally really discovered them in high school, watching uh, local broadcasts of their early films, I thought, where have they been hiding all my life? And of course, in those days, there was no such thing as video on demand or a TCM or DVDs or Blu-rays. I would get the TV guide each week and go through it and circle when there were movies I wanted to watch, which were invariably in that nether world of late night television, past Johnny Carson, past The Tomorrow Show, into that uh, strange twilight world of local car commercials and strange strange things and if I saw that a movie was starting if I saw that you know Horse Feathers was going to start at 2.38 a.m. I just somehow in my youth willed myself to stay awake through all of the whatever was scheduled in the normal prime time and past that and past that and just watched the film and then was able to cross it off my list. There were revival houses, but they were few and far between. So it really was watching, keeping, being on the lookout for local TV showings of uh, of early films. And there was something about the Marx Brothers. I mean, I, I knew about and enjoyed Laurel and Hardy and the Three Stooges when I was six, Abbott and Costello, and I liked Charlie Chaplin and some of the silent comics. 
but there was something about the brilliant combination of funny uh, visuals with really clever dialogue, whether it was the Chico Groucho malaprops of English or Groucho's deft way of uh, twisting words and puns and double entendres and also snubbing his nose at thumbing his nose at authority which you know most of us couldn't do but wished we could so there was that wish fulfillment thing i tried a bit of it i mean in in high school i did win class clown and i was known for muttering things uh, sort of under my breath but loud enough for people to hear in the back of the classroom and every now and again the teacher would appreciate it but for the most part, you really can't get away with the things that Groucho got away with. And I thought, man, I would love to meet this guy and thank him for all the laughs. But by the time I graduated high school, he was in his early 80s. And then I saw that he was doing a series of one-man shows, including at the Dorothy Chandler Pavilion in Los Angeles. And I thought, I've got to go see that. Tickets were $9.50, and I don't think that would buy you a parking space in their lot now. But at the time, it was a solid amount for me, and I went with a friend of mine, and they were terrible seats, but the idea that I was in the same room, however cavernous, as Groucho Marx meant the world to me, and I clapped so hard that my hands stung the next morning from having clapped so hard, because, you know, as strange as this may sound, I wanted the vibrations of my applause to reach his eardrums way up on the stage because I knew that would be as close as I would ever get to meeting Groucho Marx. There was some disappointment in seeing him there because he had become somewhat diminished from a series of strokes and just getting older, and the press had done a frustratingly good job of covering up the fact that he wasn't the same guy that had been hosting You Bet Your Life in the 50s, that time had slowed him, his walk was a shuffle and his speech was a little slurred, but it was still just galvanizing to be able to see him way on stage in the same auditorium. Then afterwards, in the parking garage, I spotted Zeppo Marx, uh, who I recognized from fo recent photos, and I thought, well, I'll never meet Groucho, but I can at least meet one of the Marx brothers. So I went over and I said, excuse me, Mr. Marx, I just wanted to let you know how much I enjoy you in your films. And he said, you weren't enjoying me, you were enjoying my brothers. And I thought, well, that, that's what I get for trying to pay this man a compliment. But having seen Groucho on stage and been sort of brusquely dealt with by Zeppo, that was a pretty good night. And uh, after that, I f would, it would be so frustrating. I would hear people say, oh, I saw Groucho and his, wearing his jaunty beret and sweater. He was walking in Beverly Hills and uh, I see him all the time. And I think, how can I, where should I, camp out so that I can meet this guy. And I, I heard that he ate at Jacopo's Pizzeria in Beverly Hills. So my friend Daryl and I went to Jacopo's one night and we looked and uh, on the menu they had the Groucho special and I thought, well, you know, Beverly Hills restaurants named sandwiches after people that ate there in 1958. So I said to the waitress, does Groucho Marx really come in here? And she said, oh, yes, as a matter of fact, he was here, let me think, oh, yesterday. And, uh, oh, he's so funny. He, he always comes in here right after we open and tries to pay with a $100 bill, and he knows we can't make change. And I thought, why is Groucho being wasted on this waitress? I must meet him. And uh, it was really frustrating. And I used to literally dream about meeting him and they would be vivid dreams and I would wake up and it was so frustrating as the image would dissolve and I'd realize that I hadn't met him after all. And then came the Animal Crackers campaign. Uh, Animal Crackers was a 1930 Paramount Marx Brothers film 
that um, had been part of the package of early Paramount films sold to MCA in the late 50s that allowed MCA to show them on television or re-release them, whichever they wanted. And in the case of Animal Crackers, basically due to a clerical error, the copyright had expired and the rights had reverted back to the authors and the composers of the original Broadway play, George Kaufman, Maury Riskin, Harry Ruby, and Bert Kalmar. And Universal didn't think there was any reason to spend good money trying to untangle this legal snag on an old black and white Marx Brothers movie. But since all my friends were Marx Brothers fans, this was like the holy grail, this, this great lost Marx Brothers film, which had never really been lost. It had just fallen into expired copyright. So it had never been shown on television. It wasn't part of Universal's package of MCA early comedies that they would uh, rent to local TV stations. And of course, to my friends and I, it was ludicrous to think that it wasn't worthwhile to finally bring this film back out, which hadn't been in theaters in decades. And as I say, hadn't been on television. So I managed to get in touch with Aaron Fleming, who was the controversial actress that had started out as Groucho's secretary and become his, really had been become in charge of his life. I knew about her from the cover of an Esquire magazine that showed Groucho and Aaron. I started a committee at UCLA where I was a history student and we were the committee for the re-release of Animal Crackers and we had a table on Bruin Walk and a petition drive and there were all these other tables with you know frivolous things like ending the war in Vietnam and gay rights and Iranian students and uh, legalizing marijuana and here we were trying to get a Marx Brothers movie <laughs> off the shelf it was we were met with so much skepticism because people were so scared, you know, this was in the era of the Watergate break-in and CIA shenanigans and people wanted to know, you know, who's going to get these petitions and do you have to be a registered voter? And it's like, no, this is just to show Universal that we have an audience that wants to see this film. So Aaron Fleming arranged for Groucho to come to UCLA one day a lot of reporters and a crowd of kids standing around us and I finally got to meet my hero and I said Groucho I am very happy to be meeting you after all this time and he said well you should be and Aaron Fleming said this is Steve Stoliar he's the one trying to get Animal Crackers re-released and Groucho said did you get it and I said not yet but we're working on it and he said, well, you better get it or I'll fire you. And I said, really, I didn't realize I was working for you. H how much are you paying me? And he said, a little less than nothing. And uh, we were off and running, although my, you know, my heart was pounding out of my chest with excitement. I mean, the whole tableau of cameras and microphones from the press thrust in our face and hundreds of students crowding in to hear Groucho's whispery voice and I'm trying to think clearly while talking with Groucho you know I realized then that there was a lot more left of Groucho than I had thought at the Dorothy Chandler Pavilion one reporter said Mr. Marks what is the purpose of your appearance here today and Groucho said I expect to get lunch and she said but no uh, beyond that and he said I may get dinner. So it was really just an astonishing thing to be sitting with my hero and chatting with him. And then uh, not long after that, Universal relented and cleared the rights and struck two prints, one for Los Angeles and one for New York. As a UCLA student, it was particularly gratifying to see the lines all the way down the block at the UA Westwood Theater just to see this movie that I had wanted to see after all these years. And it ended up breaking the uh, box office record at that theater that had been set by the French Connection a few years earlier. So it was very gratifying to be able 
to see that uh, it was more than just a handful of old movie buffs that wanted to see this. And, you know, it was one of their best films. Uh, it was their second film. It's the one in which Groucho plays Captain Spaulding and the one where he says, I shot an elephant in my pajamas. And, you know, it, it, it deserved to be out, but Universal needed convincing. So that summer, the summer of 74, I had two summer jobs fall through for which I remain eternally grateful because my dad was uh, hammering away at me, you know, I don't want you sitting on your fanny all summer. I want you to get a job. I want you to make some money. I don't want you just sitting around the house, da, 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 da. So I thought, well, I have nothing left to lose. And I called up Aaron Fleming and I said, is there anything at all that you think I could possibly? And she said, well, actually, I had been Groucho's secretary, but now I'm his manager and we need someone to handle all of the fan mail that's been coming in and also to organize all of Groucho's memorabilia that's going to be donated to the Smithsonian after he's gone and it needs to be someone who really knows their Marx Brothers and in in my mind's eye it's like a Tex Avery cartoon where I show up on the doorstep while she's still explaining the job to me over the <laughs> over the phone I actually thought that I, I wouldn't be working at his house. I figured, well, I'm sure it's something like working in a, a Wilshire office building and then every now and again he might come in to sign uh, legal papers or photos or something like that. And Aaron said, oh no dear, you'll have your own room. You can use uh, the one that was his last wife's painting studio and you can make your own hours and come and go as you wish. And I thought, and they're paying me money to do this? And sure enough, I got to work inside his house at 1083 Hillcrest Road, Beverly Hills 90210, that famous zip code now. Walking through that door was like walking, was like Dorothy exiting the sepia house into Technicolor Munchkinland, because it was just this a s extraordinary atmosphere. I mean, first of all, the bottom line, this was Groucho Marx's house where he lived since the 50s, since he was doing You Bet Your Life. So uh, that the walls were lined with photos and letters of uh, Groucho and his brothers as kids and out of makeup and famous people that he'd known and letters from Harry Truman and just a, a rich, rich, treasure trove of the kind of just the kind of stuff I wanted to immerse myself in and it was a very egalitarian household it wasn't as if the help needed to eat in the kitchen because that's all we were were hired people uh, I would sit at the dining room table with Groucho at lunchtime and sometimes it was just Groucho and me or Groucho and Aaron and me and sometimes it would be one of Groucho's old friends, old writer friends, Hal Cantor, Irv Brecker, Nat Perrin. Sometimes it would be well-known people like Jack Lemmon or Steve Allen or uh, George Burns. I remember when George Burns came over and this was before the Sunshine Boys but I still uh, had great admiration for him as half of Burns and Allen on radio and television. And the doorbell rang and I got it and he breezed in saying, Hi, you want to live a long time? Become an actor. You live to be an old man like Groucho and me. All right, let's eat. And I sat and watched the two of them go back and forth talking about vaudeville houses they played in the teens and 20s and just realizing how fortunate I was to witness this kind of this back and forth between these old vaudevillians. It, it actually was sort of like the Sunshine Boys, except the movie didn't exist yet because Burns' best friend Jack Benny was rehearsing in the role opposite Matthau, and it was only when Benny died unexpectedly of uh, stomach cancer in late 74 that Burns was summoned to pinch hit for his old friend and that led to a whole renaissance of interest in, in George Burns as a superstar. But I certainly 
fully drank in the experience of having him at Groucho's lunch table. And then, I mean, to be able to sit and converse with Groucho, to ask him all the questions I'd had for years, get his input on things. He was still very attuned to what was going on politically. He hated Nixon, was thrilled that he resigned. He wasn't crazy about Gerald Ford, but thought Betty Ford, he had a lot of admiration for Betty Ford. He liked her personally. And I came to appreciate Groucho on, on three separate historic levels. On one level, he was that man with the grease paint mustache and duck soup and, and horse feathers and uh, you bet your life. And second, he was someone who personally knew these iconic people who to me only existed in black and white or on paper like George Gershwin and W.C. Fields and James Thurber and Robert Benchley and Irving Thalberg, you know, to hear his firsthand stories of spending time with them was amazing. And then of course he was a man from 1890. He was a literal Victorian. I asked him once how far back he remembered and he said, I guess the Spanish-American War, which was 1898. So he would have been eight years old then. And his career as a performer before the brothers were into comedy, they were singers, sometimes as soloists. And Groucho was actually on the bill along with Enrico Caruso and a lot of other stage performers at a benefit performance at the Metropolitan Theater in New York. Uh, the money generated from which went to help the victims of the San Francisco earthquake of 1906. So this man was just this living link to all of this history. And as I say, I was a history major then, so I really appreciated the breadth and scope of what he had witnessed and how fortunate I was to be sitting there with him. I mean, if all I'd ever wanted to do was shake his hand, I, I got that and just exponentially more. Um, I mean, his, his first-hand memories went from before the Wright brothers to after the moon landing, which is, you know, it really is mind-boggling. I was, uh, I would handle the fan mail and autograph requests, and I never lost sight of the fact of what it was like to want his autograph, or I'd hear the tour vans go by, and if I was in the kitchen, I'd wave through the window, figuring that someone from Milwaukee took a picture and said, I don't know, it, it could be Groucho's hand waving, I just wasn't sure. I never took any of it for granted, and I ended up working there for the last three years of his life, which, which was a fairly tempestuous time because Aaron Fleming was, in addition to being devoted to him and responsible for a lot of the renewed interest in Groucho, and in addition to the fact that he was very fond of her, she was very tempestuous and mercurial and actually ended up being diagnosed as a paranoid schizophrenic she was on a lot of uh, prescription drugs and recreational drugs. And so she was very volatile and given to fits of rage, slamming doors and screaming and firing people. And it Groucho's blood pressure would shoot up dangerously high. I think she didn't really accept the fact that he was mortal. I mean, to me, in a sense, he was immortal, but I also appreciated the fact that he was this aging man with health problems in his, his mid 80s with, with hardening of the arteries and a history of problems. And I think she felt like if she yelled loud enough, it would shake the rust off his brain or something like that. And then he would go back to being the way he was, which isn't the way, you know, humans work. So she was, uh, you know, a positive presence in his life, but also you know, there were elements of what is now called elder abuse because she would scream at him, basically blaming him for growing older, telling him to stop coughing because it sound drives her crazy and calling him Methuselah. And it was very difficult for me because I was like 20 years old 
and I'd never dealt with a volatile personality like that. And my, I was, I was, and remain grateful to her for being hired. But it was painful and difficult to watch the way she would treat him sometimes. So I had to do this remarkable balancing job at a very early age because I cared about Groucho and wanted to be as much of a kind of buffer as I could, understanding that if I reached too far, I would be out on my butt because Aaron fired people even if there was no reason she was so paranoid she saw conspiracies where there weren't any and so she would go from thinking someone was the most wonderful person in the world to just evil incarnate and out on their butt they go that uh, somehow i managed to be the longest surviving employee there except for arturo the gardener who was literally and figuratively on the outside and not part of the intrigue inside and there came to be these two factions. There were there was uh, Aaron's friends, her younger uh, Hollywood people, uh, Bud Cord and Sally Kellerman and Elliot Gould, and then there were Groucho's longtime old friends, the old writers that I felt much more of a kinship with than I did with her kind of strange, strange younger Hollywood crowd. And then, and in an in with the older, more familiar people were Groucho's family, his son Arthur, and his daughters Miriam and Melinda. But you know, I came to realize that the color of truth was gray. That I couldn't just say, "I wish Arthur were in charge of Groucho instead of Aaron," because Groucho and Arthur had had a history of ups and downs throughout Arthur's life, long before Aaron Fleming came on the scene. So, and Aaron had always said that if Arthur were ever in charge of Groucho, he'd put him in a home and assisted living. Groucho did not want to do that. He wanted to stay in his house. And I never knew how much of what Aaron said was true or just exaggeration or complete fabrication. But I knew that there would be problems if somehow it were arranged that Arthur took over and Aaron was out of the picture. So it was a very volatile situation. And there ended up being a conservatorship battle between Aaron and Arthur. And uh, I gave a three-day deposition that was, uh, that was scary stuff, sitting in a Century City office building with these two high-priced lawyers peppering me with questions. but And it became clear that I was grateful to Aaron, but I didn't give her carte blanche the way she treated Groucho. And they ended up, the judge ended up selecting Groucho's longtime friend, Nat Perrin, who had worked on Monkey Business and Duck Soup and went on to create the Adams Family and, and was just a great, a grand fellow. He made him temporary conservator and to my astonishment, Nat, you know, Nat said, uh, you know, the judge gave me uh, the power to hire and fire. And I said, you know, so so is this it for me? And on the contrary, he wanted me to stay at the house on weekends as a sort of traffic cop between the two warring factions and keep from Groucho that there was this battle going on. So for Groucho, it was just different people coming and visiting with him. Uh, at different times of the day, but I was actually it, it, in charge of making sure that the Aaron people didn't collide with the Arthur people. And of course, Aaron couldn't stand the idea that this this servant was telling her that her time is up. It, it was a real balancing act, and I think I did a lot of growing up then. But, you know, as again with the Wizard of Oz, uh, analogy what Dorothy says something towards the end like some of it was terrible but most of it was wonderful and that's how that was uh, I, I loved the atmosphere of being around creative people especially as I say Groucho's uh, old writers and directors and longtime friends many of whom I knew from reading the Groucho letters so I was familiar with who these people were and they were startled and pleased that I knew who they were because I was just this kid in faded jeans and tennis shoes 
you know, they probably figured I was just some pot smoking hippie that listened to loud rock music. They and, and Groucho were pleased that I knew about Gershwin and Irving Berlin and Thurber and the Algonquin Round Table. And so, you know, when like Irving Brecker would introduce himself to me, it's like, well, you know, you probably don't know who any of us guys are. And it's like, no, you wrote at the circus and go west and co-wrote Meet Me in St. Louis. And my, my brain would flip to the Rolodex card on them. It, it really was a rich and rewarding experience. And I ended up shifting from a history major to motion picture television. And uh, after I graduated, and after Groucho was gone, I, I worked at Universal in the Steno Pool from 11 to 8, typing Beretta and Kojak and Rockford Files scripts. And then I was hired by Dick Cavett, whom I met because of the Groucho connection. Dick Cavett hired me to move to New York and write for him at HBO. And so that was my, quote, big break. Um, and I, you know, and I owe it to Groucho because uh, he, Groucho took a sort of avuncular or paternal interest in the young comedians, which at the time were Woody Allen and Dick Cavett that he was particularly fond of, and he would give them advice on their material and so on. And when uh, Dick Cavett's first book, Cavett, came out in late '74, Groucho and Woody Allen provided dust jacket blurbs and Groucho got an advanced copy and he shuffled into my office one day and he said, read this, you'll enjoy it. And I thought, well, all right, I, I, I guess I better read this because he's asking me about it. And I started reading Cabot's book and I just was relating to this guy on every page all about losing your mother at an early age and being shy around girls and having a fascination with the classic radio and film comedians, but I doubted that we'd ever meet because he was one of those New York snobs and I was stuck in Los Angeles. But I wrote him a letter based on something he said in the book, and then he wrote back and we started a correspondence. And then when Groucho died in August of 1977, I figured, well, that's it. All of my uh, coaches turned back into pumpkins. And there's no reason that someone like Dick Cavett would want to stay in touch with me because the pipeline to the Groucho household was was severed. But instead, he called me from New York and he said, listen, just because Groucho's gone, I hope we're not going to lose touch. And by the way, I hope you don't mind, but I've shown some of your letters to Woody and he says they're very well written. So I emptied the urine out of my shoes. So Cavett and I would correspond and then as I say he hired me to write for him and we had many wonderful adventures in New York and I met Woody and a number of people made that big switch from being a basically a production secretary at Universal to being a writer and Cavett's been a sort of big brother uh, not in the Orwellian sense to me ever since you know as I, I, I owe so much to that whole whole period, that three-year period of 74 to 77, of going into Groucho's house, it, it was every day at first. You know, Aaron had said I could make my own hours, so the first week I worked six days a week, and then on Sunday morning I was back home in, in the family house in Tarzana. And I was thinking, why would I rather be here than at Groucho's house? And I showered and dressed and drove back. So initially it was seven days a week because I just could not get enough just immersing myself in all in that in the atmosphere and in the memorabilia. All the I mean scripts with Groucho's handwritten annotations, letters, there were clippings from the vaudeville years, reviews from when the brothers were on stage in the teens and 20s. Just an amazing, amazing thing. And I'm not sure if, if uh, your listeners have had this experience where you meet someone when you're young and then when you're older, 
you come to realize who they were and you go, oh man, I wish I had been able to appreciate them at the time. I'd like to go back in time. I would have asked them this and this. In my case, because I was such a fanatic about the Marx Brothers and classic Hollywood and would much rather sit in the dark and watch old movies than go to some you know, frat party and drink beer, I was able to appreciate, as I say, all of this, this panoply of vintage Hollywood people. The only time I missed, and that's a pretty good, pretty good batting average, was Arthur Sheikman's wife, Gloria. Arthur Sheikman was one of Groucho's oldest friends. He was Nat Perrin's writing partner and a, a prolific comedy writer at Paramount and, and early Hollywood. And he had a wife that was very vivacious and bright and uh, attractive. And Groucho would just refer to her as Gloria Sheikman. Gloria Sheikman's coming over. Gloria Sheikman's going to be here for lunch. And I enjoyed the lunches we had, but it was only afterwards that I came to realize Gloria Sheikman in her pre-married days was Gloria Stewart who younger listeners would know from as the old lady in Titanic, but I knew as the female lead in The Invisible Man with Claude Rains and The Old Dark House with Boris Karloff. She worked with Shirley Temple. She was in um, The Gold Diggers of 1935. Uh, I would have had questions about James Whale and Busby Berkeley and that sort of thing. But, you know, that, as I say, it was a pretty good batting average that I knew who everyone else was. So I got to meet so many startling, fascinating people. And I have the unique claim to fame of having dated the same girl that Zeppo Marx dated. Um, she was 19, I was 20, and he was 74. So it was one of those May, December of the following year. It wasn't really a romance. She had come with me to dinner at Groucho's one night when Zeppo was up from Palm Springs. And she was very attractive, blonde hair, blue eyes, and had a, a, a brilliant mind. And Zeppo was kind of enchanted with her. He said, you know, you and Linda should visit me in Palm Springs sometime. And I said, I don't know, I was there when I was a kid and it was sweltering. And he said, well, when were you there during the summer? And I said, yeah. And he said, well, you know, Steve, it's cold in Alaska during the winter too. So uh, when she and I broke up, uh, I had some photos I wanted him to sign. And along with the cover letter, I said, by the way, we broke up. Do you have any advice for the lovelorn since he had been around the track a few times. And he called me from Palm Springs, said, Steve is Zeppo Marx. Uh, I don't want to step on your toes, but uh, do you think that Linda would go out with me? And I thought, this is really weird. I write him asking for, you know, what, what he suggests I do to help, uh, help me over the bump. And instead he's hitting on her. And I thought, well, you know, she got a kick out of him, and I don't know. And I said, well, I'll, I'll ask her. She, she thought it was an intriguing thing as well, so she agreed. And he ended up taking her to, to dinner in San Diego and then to a high ally game in Tijuana, uh, which I guess was his idea of a first date, dinner in, in uh, San Diego and a high ally game. And... Uh, the next time I saw him, he said, I want you to know, Steve, I never even kissed a good night. You need to know that. She was very nice, but all she did was talk about herself. And then I saw her on campus, and she said, Zeppo, he was very nice, but all he did was talk about himself, which I thought, <laughs> thought was kind of an interesting bookend. And then if when I would be at parties at Groucho's and Zeppo was there, he would introduce me to people, always saying, this is Steve. He and I dated the same girl, but he got further with her than I did. So I have this strange distinction of having, uh, and, and I mean, wasn't that light years away from my experience in the Dorothy Chandler parking lot of Zeppo saying, you weren't enjoying me, you were enjoying my brothers. So, you know, again, 
since I was through the door of Groucho's house, even if people weren't sure why I was there or if some of Groucho's friends wondered if I was his grandson or what my business was, they accepted me. And so there wasn't any kind of, you know, I don't know who you are, why are you talking to me? It was very comfortable. And I got to see a side of Zeppo you know, I had heard that he uh, he really lit up a room when he would walk into it and he had a great sense of humor and you weren't able to appreciate it in the films they did. And it really was true. It made me wonder what must it have been like. Gummo, who was the, the other brother who was still alive and had left the act in vaudeville to go fight World War I, he would also come up with Zeppo from Palm Springs. And I would watch the three surviving Marx Brothers interacting and I thought what must it have been like with all five brothers at the at the dinner table in the olden days but um, it just was a, a rich and and life-changing experience for me I I ended up writing a book called raised eyebrows my years inside Groucho's house which is available in paperback and Kindle and audiobook with me doing all the voices, big surprise, on Amazon. Or if someone wants to get a signed copy, they can get it from uh, my website, Steve Stolier, S T O L I A R dot com. And I'm happy to inscribe it to you or whomever you wish. And I'm happy to say that the book has been optioned and is currently in development to become a motion picture which will be very strange to see someone playing me at 19 with my mutton chops and mustache and full head of hair. Um, it hasn't gotten to the casting point yet, but uh, it's moving along and it's going to be positively surreal to see this story because it isn't a biography of Groucho. It's, uh, it's, you know, the three main characters are this aging legend and this ambitious young woman and this impressionable kid dropped into this petri dish and their interactions so that's uh in the offing and i hope not too far out wow um that's the I, short I, answer to your question yeah I, i've really enjoyed your story i want to get in here a little bit though and sure. talk about what you're doing today your voiceover work and and in the film industry so what keeps you busy now? Well, I had done a number of television shows some years back, Simon and Simon and Murder, She Wrote and the new KRP in Cincinnati and Sliders. And I've, uh, I've produced a number of pop culture documentaries on a, a wide array of people from Martin Luther King to John Lennon to Champ Howard. The book to film transition of raised eyebrows is occupying a chunk of my time. I, I wrote the initial screenplay and am working on it uh, still with another writer. I don't know that I can divulge details yet because it hasn't been officially announced, but it's going quite well. And I'm co-exec producer in addition to co-writer of the screenplay. So I'm involved in that. And, you know, and that was another case of, uh, it's like when I wrote the book, people said, you'll have no trouble getting a publisher because that you've got a unique perspective into a legendary Hollywood figure that no one else has. And my cover letter would say, uh, this is not a biography of Groucho Marx. It's the story of a fan and his hero. And I would get rejection slips that said, we're not interested in any Groucho Marx biographies at this time. So that was frustrating, but then it finally got published. And then in terms of the film version, you know, people would read it and they'd say, you know, this reminds me of either my favorite year or Sunset Boulevard or Ed Wood, you know, this kind of quirky story of this young person. In there. And I ran into similar resistance. People, producers would read the book and say, I, you know, this is a wonderful book, but I, I don't see a movie in this unless you bookend a complete biography of Groucho with your experience. And I thought, I see that I am going to have to climb up the tree and saw off the branches of the story that aren't part of the movie so that you can see that it is a movie with a beginning, middle and end 
And that's what I did, and that's when things started happening. So you sort of sometimes have to lay it out for them, and then they go, oh, I see, yeah, that's pretty good. So there's that. I also uh, recently co-authored the memoir of a wonderful man named Howard Storm, who was a stand-up comic in the 50s and early 60s, then became a very successful TV director as a uh, as director, for instance, of, of every episode of the first three years of Mork and Mindy. He was also, he's also the last surviving member of that group of funny guys at the Carnegie Deli in Broadway, Danny Rose. He has a long history with Woody Allen and they were both represented by Jack Rollins in their stand-up days. So we wrote this book called The Imperfect Storm from Henry Street to Hollywood that covers Howard's life which is a pretty fascinating one because he grew up in the depression on the Lower East Side of New York in a tough Jewish neighborhood. His father knew all these mobsters, Louis Lepke and, uh, and, uh, and Howard worked in a lot of mobbed up clubs with people shooting at each other and threatening each other before he worked in more legitimate places. He was a great storyteller and people said, you've got to write your story down. And he asked me, because we were friends and he liked the Groucho book. And he said, I know I'm never gonna do this on my own. Will you write it with me? And I did, and it, and it was a wonderful adventure digging into his life. So that's, that's only recently out and uh, people seem to enjoy it. And I do uh, occasional, I'm, I've done animation voiceovers, several of the Charlie Brown Peanuts cartoons, Frosty Returns, which has become a perennial that they always run right after the original Frosty the Snowman at holiday time. So it's nice to get a residual check every year because it's now become, you know, one of those beloved holiday classics they dust off and show at the winter time. Um, I've narrated a number of documentaries and uh, radio work and this and that. And as I say, my audio book of raised eyebrows. So I keep busy with this and that. And like that. Well, something that I'm interested in that we're not going to be able to talk about right now, yes. but I want to have you back on the show, yes. is your relationship with Woody Allen. Oh, yeah. Uh, he's one of my favorites, and I would just love to pick your brain and hear all the wonderful stories you have. I understand that you uh, have a correspondence with him that you keep up. Yeah. Uh, so uh, if, if you would... I would like show. to come back and talk about the the only thing I'll say just because I look for any chance to say it is despite despite the daunting smear campaign that Mia Farrow has conducted uh, aided and abetted by their son Ronan Farrow there and I'm not just saying this because I I've been a fan of Woody since I was a kid and we're friends. I'm saying it because it's true. There is nothing remotely true about the molestation allegations and there's so much evidence that it didn't happen. He was cleared way back when Mia made the accusation and it's it's very frustrating and very upsetting for me to see so many people part of it is just you know living in the twitter verse where people just scroll through news stories and go oh oh this old this old director did this well he's a monster and let's see what the kardashians are doing da da da, da and they don't look beneath the surface but it's very frustrating cuz she has sort of fatty arbuckled him and there's so many people that think that he's just a vile creature and it just ain't so I'd be happy to talk about that in detail, as well as just other wonderful things like hanging out on the set of Cafe Society and, you know, him explaining to me why he did certain shots and what to do if I wanted to be a director. I mean, he sort of took me under his wing as well. And he was a big fan of Raised Eyebrows, said it was one of the best books about uh, an icon he'd ever read and that it was written with real wit. He's also a big fan of the Howard Storm book. It wrote me a letter saying, you guys really aced this one, which was very gratifying. So he, yeah, there's plenty to say about him. And I, I should also say that my wife, my late wife had been the victim of child abuse 
So I am not one who gives people the benefit of the doubt on that. I tend to want to use abusers as human pinatas. But even my late wife knew that Woody was not the type. And she looked at all the evidence and said, he's innocent. And if anyone could have been forgiven for siding with the accusing child against a possible molester, it would have been my wife. But even she knew that that's not what was going on here. And she would be very disappointed to see that the pendulum swung the other direction. But as you say, that is for another time.